Well, I'm excited about what the Lord is doing here at the Gateway Church. Are you excited about how God is moving? And I'm excited about the Gospel of John. How many have been enjoying the study in the Gospel of John? All right, a few of you. I appreciate that. (laughs) And we've been taking a chapter at a time. And so far, we've asked you to pre-study and then come together and kind of digest a a meal of sort of a message and then to do some post-study afterwards. And that has been working pretty good. How many of you, just be honest, um, don't raise your hand. Um, if, if this is not true, but how many of you have, do, have been doing some pre-study? So for today, J- John chapter 4, you've been doing a little pre-study before you get here t- uh, this morning, all right? Okay, about three or four of you, five of you, good. All right, so that means we got a lot of work to do, all right? Men and women of faith. You've got an opportunity each week. You know where we're headed. Next week, John chapter 5. Do a little pre-study. Let's come together and study together. And then even some post-study saying, God, what did you say and how does that work? Well, if you were doing some pre-study this, this week for John chapter 4, and you maybe read or reread John chapter 4, you know that there is so much good material in John chapter 4. There are some pastors that preach line by line that take five, six, and even seven weeks to preach through the chapter 4. And we're going to try to do it in one setting. And so lock the doors. And uh, you guys have uh, heard of Gilligan's Isle, the three-hour tour. No, just kidding. I'm just, it's just a joke. We're not going to take that long. We're going to do our best to get through it. But in John chapter 4, let's think about it. The famous story of the woman at the well. Plus, at the end of the chapter, there's the, the healing of the boy who was close to death. There are so many possible themes, themes of living water and an awaiting harvest and worship. If you, how many have heard we should worship in spirit and in truth, right? You've heard that? That's from John chapter 4. There's some Old Testament references that are fun to research. Sowing and reaping. The great, one of the great mission scriptures of all time. Look up. The fields are ripe to harvest. That's from John chapter 4. And then there's the huge I am statement. Jesus directly reveals himself to the woman at the well. And I don't want to be a spoiler there, but the the only one other time when Jesus is on the cross did he say directly that I am the Savior. And there was so much that we could take and look at. Um, I seriously, at one point, I was getting nervous. I was feeling overwhelmed. That's like when I mentioned in worship, I I closed my books, I turned off the the, the study, and uh, I said, Lord, I just need to hear a word from you for us this morning. And, uh, and I didn't want to read another thing. I didn't want to listen to another thing. I needed to draw close to the Lord. How many have ever been there before where you just need a word from the Lord? And I, I realized as I did that on Thursday afternoon, um, I didn't need, I don't really need to tell you what you don't know or pull some secret hidden realities out of John chapter 4. Instead, I am impressed to walk through the story of the woman on the well and uh, the 42 verses, and we'll get through it, don't worry, and let the Holy Spirit speak through His Word because He does a better job than I could ever do, right? And I want you, as we read this and kind of track through these verses, to begin to see this story through the perspective of this woman at the well historically, maybe the way you've learned it or studied it, certainly the way that I kind of grew up thinking about this story, you think about the woman at the well, that she's kind of an adulterer, kind of an outcast, kind of an immoral lady. And, um, but I want to be careful that we're not quick to throw her underneath the bus, uh, but to see her instead with love and with compassion. And it, 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 it really is a different focus, at least for me. And I want us to see... Uh, this woman with open eyes and to see her like Jesus may have seen her. And you may think, well, she doesn't deserve grace and mercy. I know some of her story. Maybe you've read, pre- done some pre-study. But let me just remind you, you don't deserve grace and mercy either. <laughs> and I don't either. I don't deserve forgiveness or salvation. And uh, so let's, with that perspective, let's, uh, let's dive into the story. And actually, before we do, one other quick uh, reminder, turn with me to John chap- 
chapter 20, verse 31. This is the verse we're saying, hey, you should memorize this. We're going to look at it probably every week. Um, it tells us why the Gospel of John was written, why the Apostle John wrote. He says this, but these were written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. And so we are revealing who Jesus is. And even in this story, we're going to see it very clearly. And, uh, and again, spoiler alert, the, the, even Jesus declares himself as the Christ, the Son of God, the Anointed One. And you think about the claim that we're going to read where Jesus says, I am that guy. I am the Messiah. You think about that. And there's only three choices. This is from C.S. Lewis. You've probably heard this. But either Jesus was lying and he knew that he wasn't the Son of God, or he was a lunatic, lunatic, he thought he was the Son of God, but he really wasn't, or he really is the Son of God. He is the Lord. And if that's the case, we need to surrender to him. Amen? And so, Lord, help us. I, I just want to say he is, <laughs> if you had any, uh, any concern about that, he is Lord. He's Lord. And uh, with that, let's turn in our Bibles to John chapter 4. Let's look at these great verses together. Starting in verse 1, says this. It says, Now Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard that he was gaining and baptizing more disciples than John. Everybody say, there's a problem. Okay. Problem. Although, in fact, it was not Jesus who baptized, but it was his disciples. So he left Judea and went back once more to Galilee. Now, pause here for a second. There's a lot going on in these verses. Baptisms are happening. They're, Jesus is preaching the kingdom of God. Uh, he's preaching a, a message of repentance. At the same time, John the Baptist is doing the same thing, at least for a short time here. And then he ends up in prison. He ends up losing his head, uh, if you know that story. The problem here is not with John the Baptist. Remember, we talked about that in, at the end of chapter 3. It wasn't John the Baptist. The problem was with the religious leaders. And instead of facing the problem, Jesus, it says, he went from Judea and went back once more to Galilee. He, fl he fled. He walked away from the problem that was at hand. Now, in the next few verses, we see Jesus stepping into another problem, another situation. And some would take the first six verses and preach it, and I love it, that when do you walk away? When do you stay and fight? And, uh, it, but we don't have time to talk about that. So uh, let's just look at the next few verses. It says, now he had to go through Samaria. So he came to the town in Samaria called Sychar, near the plot of ground Jacob had given his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, he sat down by the well. It was about noon. Now, the, what we see here is, number one, I want you to see Jesus full of humanity. He's tired. He's thirsty, right? And again, there's a lot going on here, but it says he had to go through Samaria. Now, what do we know about Samaritans? The Good Samaritan, you guys have all heard that story, right? What was wrong? In that story, there were three different people. The one least likely to help was the Samaritan. They, had get, they were, uh, the Samaritans were half Jews, and we could talk about it a long time, but they were kind of forced out and had forced to marry. And for hundreds of years of history, they were hated by the Jews. And there was this feud and this racial tension that was very, very real. The bottom line, and we won't take all the time to look at it, but G the Jews could not stand the Samaritans, and the Samaritans could not stand the Jews. They didn't get along. And there's a misconception that sometimes Jews would go around the city of Samaria, or around the, the region of Samaria, adding a 20 to 25 uh, miles. Uh, did we get the, the map? Or Yeah, so, so you see Judea here and then Samaria. Sometimes they'd go to the coast or over to per, uh, Perea and then up and through to Galilee. That would happen only on rare occasions. Maybe a rabbi, uh, maybe a Jewish leader would skirt the city just to make a point that they didn't like Samaria. But there were people that would go right through Samaria. And so we see that Jesus, he's leaving Judea in the south, making his way to Galilee. But verse 4 says he had to go. He had to go through Samaria. 
And this is not a sense like, yeah, he could have skirted it. There's other ways to get to Galilee. But this was a divine appointment. That's what it means. Directly from the Heavenly Father, Jesus was following God's perfect will for his life, and he had to go to Samaria to meet the woman at the well. And I want to pause here just briefly and say that God, in a similar way, he orders our steps. He orders your steps. When we're in tune with his spirit, he will lead us. He will guide us. In Psalm chapter 37, verse 23, it says, The Lord makes firm the steps of the one who delights in him. Look, when you delight yourself in the Lord, he is going to direct you along your way. And he's going to give you opportunities just like he has with the woman at the well. So he was led, Jesus was, to Sakar. In Sakar, that word means drunkenness. And so he was led to a town of drunkenness where there's a lot of immorality. And he finds himself at high noon. Some of your Bibles may say it was the sixth hour. And my study showed that John was using a Jewish time and uh, that the day would start at 6 a.m. And so the sixth hour would be right at high noon, the heat of the day. And what I want you to see is that Jesus is stepping into a heavily, heavenly, a heavily tensioned area. And then we come to verse 7 and 8. Let's look at it. It says, When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, Will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone into town to buy food. Very interesting. In that culture, women would almost never be found by themselves. They were always had a covering. A brother would be with them, a father would be with them, or a husband. And in that culture, a man would not talk to a woman, especially in public. And if they were talking in public, the, the uh, implication is that they were in a relationship together and were actually... Uh, where they would be uh, sexually active if they were talking with one, one another. It's very interesting. And so Jesus, against social expectations, as a rabbi, Jesus was a teacher, especially a Jewish teacher, he did not do what was expected or allowed. Instead, he talked to the Samaritan woman. And so you can kind of pick up some of the tension here. Jesus knew that she needed to hear, and he was less concerned with social expectations. And by the way, Jesus never, not even once, was criticized for having an inappropriate relationship. He was totally above reproach with this woman and with every woman uh, throughout the Gospels. Let's look at verse 9. The story continues. It says, The Samaritan woman said to him, You are a Jew, and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. She's bringing up hundreds of years of history here. And the idea there is that they wouldn't even use the same dishes that Samaritans would use. Jews would not use the same utensils or dishes. I was thinking about in our history here in America, how tragic it was back 30, 40, well, no, like 50, 60 years ago, the racial tension where they would have two different drinking fountains, one for black people, one for white people, and they wouldn't allow the same. That same sort of tension is the tension that should be felt when we read these verses. And so the woman, she would have been stunned that Jesus would have addressed her out in public and even talking. And that's why she says, ma'am, you asked me for a drink? And let's look at verse 10. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it was that asked you for a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. There's two phrases here I want you to underline in your Bibles if you do that. Gift of God is one. The other is living water. Gift of God and living water. And as we look at that, we we see that Jesus is not talking about the physical water, or, but he's talking about something spiritual here. He's talking about salvation. And it's important. John's readers, when they would have read this, they would have understood that. And it's important for us to understand that we need living water. Turn to your neighbor and say, you need living water. 
We need it. And Isaiah 55, verse 1, kind of describes that. I like it. It says, Come, all who are thirsty, come to the waters. Come and drink of me. And it's not enough just to be spiritual in nature. The woman actually had some spirituality, but she was ignorant. And sometimes in our culture, we may think, oh, well, if we go to church or if we do give or we do serve, that then we are in right relationship. No, we're only in right relationship when we surrender and we get the gift of God, which is eternal life, when we accept Jesus as our personal Savior. Let's look at verse 11. She says, Sir, you have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Where can I get this living water? She's talking about the physical water. Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave the well and drank from it himself, and did also his sons and his livestock? We see this here. She doesn't understand yet what Jesus is talking about. She's probably a little sarcastic in that moment. But then verse 13, Jesus answered, Everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again. He slows down and he comes back to the physical, meets her where she's thinking. So he talks about the physical, but then he moves to the spiritual. But whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. And so he takes the natural he makes it spiritual and kind of brings it to light. And I love in that verse, it says, whoever, that there's no one out of reach from God's mercy, from God's salvation. She needed a spiritual transformation. She didn't know it. Jesus is pursuing her. And then things start to shift. Let's look at verse 15. Verse 15 says, the woman said to him, sir, give me this water. And I believe she understands that something is different than just physical water at this point. She says, give me this water, this living water, so that I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water. And I would say that she wouldn't have to keep coming at noon to draw water. Let me explain. We don't know this for certain, but we most likely she had a, somewhat of a bad reputation she had, we're going to find out momentarily she had five husbands, so she, it could have been that she was an adulterer. We don't know. Some consider her a scarlet woman. Uh, but for sure, if she's coming at noon, a time when you don't draw water, she was avoiding confrontation and the stigma of the reality of her life. She was avoiding the scorn of other women that would gather water in the morning or in the evening hours. And so she was avoiding that. And it's important for us to see that. And then we see this divine appointment coming to a head. And I love this because when there are divine appointments, even in our own lives, when God uses us to reach through, often there's insight, a word of knowledge, a word of wisdom, that we've become, we get to know what we don't know, so to speak, and we don't even know where it came from, but all of a sudden you say something that was a nugget of truth that really kind of breaks the ice and helps soften someone's heart. Maybe you've been there. Let's look at verse 16. So things are starting to move here. God, sa Jesus says, uh, he says, go, go call your husband and come back. In verse 17, she replies, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, you are right when you say you have no husband. But the fact is you've had five husbands and the man that you have is now is not your husband. What you have just said is quite true. So she doesn't lie outright. She just doesn't give the whole truth. My understanding, again, of, of uh, studying this in the past, is that this woman was kind of a rotten egg, right? She's the adulterer, the prostitute type. Almost, I looked at her, and I, I need to repent of this, but uh, almost in a self-righteous, like, I'm better than she was. And the reality is, I'm no better. I'm just like her in a lot of ways. But let me give you a different perspective of this woman that maybe you haven't considered before. And I really appreciate this perspective. With women in that day and age, they had no right to, to divorce. Only a man could, could cause a divorce. And so five different men had had her as a wife and then divorced her. Divorce was rampant in that society. And you could divorce a woman for just about anything. But something very common was the woman 
could, could, if she could not conceive, have babies, then a divorce would be allowed. Can you even imagine? So just imagine the possibility that this woman was a barren woman, divorced with no government assistant, a beggar, cast out of society, now living with a man that wouldn't even be seen with her in public, wouldn't give her the proper covering, at least in this story, and she's out there at noon getting water, shame-filled, left her own vices, no covering, and then Jesus takes her and sees her in a totally different light, full of grace and mercy. I don't know, that perspective helps me. Jesus cared for her. He validated her. And by the way, he does the same thing for you, right where you are. And at this point, she picks up on the spiritual matter at hand. In verse 19, says, Sir, the woman says, I can see that you are a prophet. Kind of the understatement of the century, right? She's saying, like, what in the world, right? And then she goes on, verse 20, Our ancestors worshipped on this mountain, but you Jews claim that the place must, where we must worship is in Jerusalem. Does she want to be right with God? I believe that the Spirit of God is working inside of her, and she's confused. Would she have to go to a temple to worship, or go to a mountain to worship, or go back to Jerusalem to worship? And Jesus answers her in verse 21, says, woman. And it's not a derogatory woman. It's the same sort of woman where Jesus at... Uh, with the where he talked to his mom that way, woman, it was real uh, compassionate. Jesus replied, "Believe me, a time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem." He's saying, "Look, there is a time where it doesn't matter where you are; you can worship anywhere." And then he goes on to say, "You Samaritans worship what you do not know. The Samaritans only believed the first five books of the Bible." Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, the Pentateuch. And that's all they study. That's all they believe. And he's saying, look, you don't have a, a complete, but we worship what we do know. For salvation is from the Jews and through Jesus, right? Yet a time is coming and has now come. This is it. When the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For they are the kinds of worshiper that the Father seeks. God is spirit, and his worshipers must worship him in spirit and in truth. And he, Jesus just lays it out. And this, this woman, her mind had to have been spinning, not understanding completely. And so her answer, and there's a whole lot there. We, you could spend a whole uh, series of messages just in those verses, but, but her mind must have been spinning. Verse 25, she says, I know that Messiah, the Christ, called Christ, is coming. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. In other words, she's saying, look, I don't understand what you just said, but one day the Messiah is going to come and everything will become clear. And then, boom, in that moment, verse 26, Jesus declared, I, the one speaking to you, I am he. I'm the one. I am the Messiah. Jesus revealed himself to the least of these. You get that? To the least of these. I mean, the, the bottom, just full of discard, a woman like this, that's who Jesus decides to reveal himself to? Come on. Just look at the difference between chapter 3, uh, where Nicodemus is meets Jesus, and remember, we didn't study that, but I told you, if you were looking at it, to, to look at the obstacles that Nicodemus had to overcome to get to Jesus. The differences between Nicodemus and the Samaritan woman are just night and day. First, Nicodemus is a man. She's a woman. He's a Jew. She's a Samaritan. He comes at night and seeks out Jesus. She doesn't even know that who Jesus is, and, uh, and she's not looking for anything, and Jesus is pursuing her. He's a Pharisee, a scholar. She's ignorant. He's morally righteous. She's an outcast, has lots of baggage, kind of a shady background, right? 
He knows the Old Testament completely, memorized probably. She has an incomplete of script, uh, understanding of Scripture. He's married. You say, how do you know he's married? Well, he's part of the Sanhedrin. It was a requirement. And she's not married. And not only is she not married, she's had five husbands. And now she's living with another man. And then Jesus comes to her and reveals himself. They both find Jesus. Ugh moral, and the outcast, and I would say, and everyone in between can find Jesus as well. Verse 14, whoever drinks the water I give, they will find life. People like Nicodemus, who are on the inside track, and the people like this woman, who's on the outside, they can find Jesus, and Jesus can change their lives. He can change our lives. Amen? Verse 27, the story continues. Just then the disciples returned and were surprised to find him talking with the woman because it just didn't happen that way. You just wouldn't see it. And so they were surprised, but no one asked, what do you want or why are you talking with her? They just kind of took it and watched it. Certainly they were thinking it in their minds. Verse 28, then leaving the, her water jar, the woman went back to town and said to the people, come and see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Messiah? What I love in this picture is that she carried her burden to the well, the water jar, but she carried her shame, her, all of her past, and it's at noon, and it's hot, and just she's worn out, right? And now she leaves she, after she meets the Savior, and she leaves her burden with Jesus. She doesn't take the water jar with her back to town. She leaves it behind. And the idea that we can leave it behind, like Judy was saying, we can leave our burdens at the altar, and we don't have to take it up again. Isn't that powerful? That's the power of the gospel. That's what Jesus offers every single one of us. And the response in verse 30 is that the people responded. They, they see this. And verse 30 says, They came out of the town and made their way toward him. If you uh, skip to verse 39, we see the end of the story. Many of the Samaritans from that town believed in Jesus because of the woman's testimony. He told me everything I ever did. So when the Samaritans came to him and urged him to stay with them, and he stayed two days, which is cool, and because of his words, many more be became believers. So people were finding salvation, that gift of God. They were finding that living water. They, then they said to the woman, we no longer believe just because of what you said. Now we have heard for ourselves. And John answers the question why this story is included in the Gospel of John. And we know that this man really is the Savior of the world. We know this is Jesus. It proves who Jesus is. Now, there's a couple things that we could take away from this. The first thing is you have to know this, is that we must know that Jesus is for outsiders and insiders and everyone in between. Who's the gospel for? The gospel is for you. He, it's for you. Jesus goes to great lengths to meet us. That's number one. The second thing is Jesus, uh, he, when he puts his finger on our lives, our pasts disappear. He says he takes our sin as far as the east is from the west. He never holds it against us. That's an incredible verse. So when he puts his thumbprint on your life, you don't have to worry about what you did or who you were in a previous life. The old is gone. The new has come. That's good news. That's good news for me. And there's no condemnation, by the way, for those that are in Christ Jesus. So we don't have to go around all moping like, oh, I used to be. No, I'm a child of the one true king. Awesome, I love it. And the woman, she felt the love of Jesus, no question. And I just want to say, no matter what you've done, no matter where you've been, know that God has been pursuing you. You may wonder, does God care? The answer is absolutely yes. The gift of God, salvation, the living water. 
And I would just want to encourage us that we can come to Jesus. We can surrender to him. We can start today or get back on the bus today if you've uh, served the Lord at one time and our need to come back to him. Say, what is the gift of God? What is that living water? It's describing in this text salvation, which includes mercy and grace and pardon for sin. It includes justification and it flows and it keeps on flowing and keeps on flowing in our lives. It reminds me of John chapter 1 verse 16 where we said that, that God or Jesus, he brings grace after grace, kind of wave after wave of grace. That's what Jesus does in our lives. The third thing kind of a takeaway is that Jesus, I believe, is saying through this story, and this could be for some of you here, I believe this deeply, Jesus is saying, I am the water that will quench your thirst. It's not sports or school. It's not alcohol. It's not food or some relationship that's going to fill you up. Only Jesus can satisfy. And in this story, Jesus used a common human experience to teach us this spiritual truth. Spiritually thirsty. Spiritually dry. I know when I'm really thirsty, the only thing that satisfies is water. I don't know if that is true for you. I don't want pop or Red Bull or anything else at that point. Give me some real water. And if it's Aquafina, it's even better, right? But I was thinking about this, and I wrote this in my notes this morning. I wasn't going to add it, but I just feel like there are some that are here that would, could be described as dehydrated Christians, that you're dry. You know, I, was, I ended up in the hospital one time when I was in high school for dehydration. I was playing basketball and just going, going, going. I wasn't taking good care of myself. And what do they do when they, they get you into the hospital? When you're dehydrated, they plug you up and they fill you with saline, with water, and they get you get back going. And it's amazing how quickly you start to feel better when you have the proper amount of water inside of you. And if you're a dehydrated Christian, dry, the word of God for you this morning is come to the water be filled again and again. Isaiah 51, come and drink of me. Those that are hunger and thirst for righteousness will be filled. That's the truth of the gospel. And then there's one last thing. Don't want to miss this in this story. Go back to verse 31. This is the response of Jesus with his disciples, the interchange there. It says, Meanwhile, the disciples urged him, Rabbi, eat something. So they went off, got something to eat. She, he's talking to the woman when he gets back. They say, hey, eat something. And Jesus says, I have food to eat that you know nothing about. They're saying, what? Where'd you get the food? You know, did she have something? Did she drop something? And, uh, and then he goes, the disciples said to each other, could someone have brought him food? And Jesus said, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish the work. There's a lot here. We're not going to hit it. Don't you say, don't you say, they know the saying, it's still four months until harvest. I tell you, open your eyes and look at the fields. They are ripe for harvest. Even now, the one who reaps draws the wage and harvest a crop for eternal life so that the sower and the reaper may be glad together. Thus the saying, one sows and another reaps, is absolutely true. I sent you to reap what you have not worked for. Others have done the hard work, and you have reaped the benefit of their labor. You say, how does this fit in with this story? I want, it, I want you to see that when you understand that you can be filled and that you can be filled to the full and to overflowing, and God wants to do that in your life, at that point, what God wants you to do is to lift up your eyes and look for those around you that are spiritually dry and bring that living water into their lives. For the sake of one, Jesus went through Samaria. He had to. He was following the orders of God, and God has some orders for us to reach out to be that living water. Let's pray. Lord, I just pray that in these next few moments we can just respond appropriately. We can commit to you our lives, everything within us. God, I just pray that you would just um, lead us and guide us. Help me 
in this next few moments to communicate exactly what you have for us in Jesus' name. Amen. The first thing I want to do, and we won't take long here, is if you're here today and you do not know Jesus as your personal Savior, we want to offer you the gift of salvation. We want to offer you that living water that is that's, is just priceless. And if you're here today and you don't know Jesus um, and you're ready to make a decision or you are away from Jesus and you want to get back on the bus, so to speak, I want you just to raise your hand right where you are and I want to pray for you. And there's no shame in it. I would just want you to, to know that, uh, that we've been praying for you. Who here this second service needs to respond and say, you know what, I need to get my life right with Jesus. Anyone? Just one. Okay, yeah, thanks. Thanks, Lupe. Who else It just needs to surrender, say, God, I need to get my life right. Anyone else? Hallelujah. For the sake of the one, we're, we're going to come back to this in just a second, but there's a, I just also want to just ask the question, how many are here today, and if you are honest, you say, man, I feel dry. I feel dehydrated spiritually. And there's no shame in this, but you're saying, man, that's just where I am today. And I need the Lord to fill me up. Yeah, lots of hands. Same as first service. And the reality is we need that. Who else? Just saying, yep, that's me. I need a refreshing of the Holy Spirit in my life. God wants to provide that for each and every one of us. He does. And then the last piece is how many of us miss opportunities that God may have? I know I do, right? I want to be the type of person that my eyes are open and that I can see people the way Jesus sees them. And so I don't miss opportunities to reap a harvest. If you want to be that type of person where you look up at the fields that are ripe for harvest and you are aware spiritually of the condition of those around you, I want you just to raise your hand as well. Absolutely. Hallelujah. Let's all stand as we close this morning. I want to lead in a sinner's prayer. I want to just, uh, just encourage everyone to pray this with me. It's not the words of this prayer that saves us. We don't understand that, but it's the heart behind it. And, uh, and so let's just pray this. Say, Dear Lord, please forgive me for all my sin. Come into my heart and make me clean. Fill me with living water. Give me that gift of God. Salvation. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You know what the Bible says? The heavens rejoice. The angels in heaven rejoice when even one person comes to the Lord. So let's just rejoice here for a moment. Hallelujah. 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 The other two points. For those that are dry, they're feeling dehydrated, I just want you to know the Lord wants to meet you right where you are. And uh, first service, we didn't take the chance to kind of respond officially. But um, I just, I'm going to commit uh, that if that's you and you're saying, man, I just need some time in the presence of God. Um, Jess, if you could find something that would be appropriate to play um, after we dismiss, I'll say, hey, let's move uh, out into the lobby before you start talking. Let's just keep this a pray, place of prayer. And uh, you can stay as long as you want just to be in the presence of God. I'm telling you, we need the presence of God. My mother-in-law said it earlier. Telma said it first service. I'm saying it again. And, uh, and if that's a desire of your heart, this is a place where you can be filled before you go and make sure that you're filled up and ready to invade. And then that last piece, I don't think any of us should be exempt from that idea that we should look up and see the lostness around us. We live on the lakeshore here. Could it be that God wants you and your life to infect someone else? And so I want to commission you as you leave to go in the grace of God, but to be filled with the Holy Spirit to overflowing. So let me pray. Lord, I pray that you just put your hand upon each of our lives 
that you would use us. And God, give us eyes to see. Lord, where we have missed it in the past, God, I pray that we will take opportunities to make a difference, to reach one more, to connect with our world, not just to be oblivious or to not care, but God, give us a passion and a burden to see the lost saved, just like we were. And God, I pray that salvation will be found as we look up at the fields that are ripe for harvest. And Lord, I pray that this would be a season of reaping for the Gateway Church, that we would see souls saved week in and week out for your glory, for your honor, we pray in Jesus' name. And so now, Lord, as we leave, I pray that you'd go before us, behind us, and all around us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.